Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Twisted Talks. I'm Josh. I'm Tanya. And this week it is Tanya's time to shine with another crime case. It's my time to shine with crime. Yes, Um, very that. So, on that note, (laughs) over to you. The case that I'm going to be covering today is the case of the Somerton Man, also known as the Tamam Shud case. So, the name Somerton also always makes me think of like an Agatha Christie novel or yeah, something. Yeah, like the Somerton Man. And I think it also makes me think of, um, remember that show? It's quite old, Midsummer Murders. Yes, actually. I've not heard of that I don't know if they're years. spelled the same, the summer part, I don't know. but um, They actually are, um, but it's. I think there's two M's in the Midsummer Murders. and there's only Because I think M it's a part place in England, actually, Midsummer is. Yeah, well, this case takes place in Australia, so it's not I recognise that much from yeah. the case, but that's all I know about it. So on December 1st, 1948, a group of people visiting Somerton Beach, which is about 11 kilometres outside of Adelaide, Australia. Adelaide. Adelaide. I don't know what accent I was supposed to be, but it wasn't Australian. <laughs> um, so they found a horrible sight. They discovered the body of a man lying with his feet resting against a seawall and his... Sorry, lying with his head resting against a seawall. Did I say his feet? You did. My apologies. Getting That's ahead the of foot myself. fetish <laughs> creeping through, Ooh, Tanya. Getting ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> did you? <laughs> getting ahead of yourself. Getting ahead of myself. So they discovered the body of a man lying with his head resting against a seawall, his feet extended and his ankles crossed. The man was wearing a suit and tie and looked to be in his 40s or 50s. Investigators believed that he had died in his sleep and upon searching his pockets, they found an unused second-class train ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, as well as a bus ticket from the city that might not have been used, an aluminium comb, or aluminium if you're American, uh, manufactured in the US, a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, which I just thought was the most random thing ever. That's like the only thing I know from from this (laughs) so far. juicy fruit. I know them. I know them. Um, He also had an army club packet of cigarettes, which had seven cigarettes of a different brand. So the army club was a British brand of fags. And then inside the box, there were seven fags from the Kensitas brand. Or cigarettes from those of you who don't know that slang. Yeah, I don't know. We just call them fags here. I don't don't know what to tell you. Um, It's not used as a slur. It's used for cigarettes. Okay. Um... So, Kensitas was a Scottish brand of fags, and as well, he had a box of Bryant and May matches, which were also a British brand. There was also an unlit cigarette on his right collar. <clears throat> However, the man had no cash and no ID on him, so police set about trying to identify him. Now, witnesses began, began coming forward at this point to say that they had seen someone matching the man's description resting in the spot where he was found on November 30th. A couple who had seen him at around 7 pm said that they had seen him stretch his right arm out to its fullest before dropping it limply to the sand. Another couple who had taken note of him from between half seven to 8 p.m. said that they had not seen him move during the 30 minutes that he was in their view, which was around the time the streetlights came on. But they did seem to think that he had changed position at some point. Um, Didn't really expand on that Mm -hmm. um, in what I read. The couple noted that they had been speaking amongst themselves about how strange it was that the man was not reacting to the mosquitoes, but they had assumed that he was either drunk or asleep, so they felt no need to investigate. One witness told police that she had seen a man looking down at the sleeping man from the top of the steps leading down to the beach, and all witnesses said that the body was in the same position as it was when police found him. Another witness came forward several years later in 1959, and reported, Such an old case. Yeah, like, like well. we're, we're talking like 1948 was when he was found. So like, was that during or just after World War Two? Just after World War Two. Yeah, because that finished in 45, I think. 45, 1945, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this witness came forward in 1959 and said that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along the beach the night before the body was discovered. Oh. Um, and a police report was made of this by Detective Don O'Doherty. Um, Now, kind of getting into the investigation side of things, um, pathologist John Burton Cleland examined the body and stated that the man was of British appearance and thought to be between 40 to 45 years old. (laughs) I'm just kind of, what what does of British appearance mean? (laughs) The exact phrasing was that he was of Britisher appearance. Britisher, that really does not bode well with my Yeah, so he was of British appearance. Um, The man was 180 centimetres or 5 feet 11 inches tall. His eyes were grey. His hair was fair to ginger in colouring with slight greying around the temples. 
He had broad shoulders and a narrow waist. His hands and nails showed no sign of manual labour and his big and little toes met in a wedge-like shape like those of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed toes. As well as this, he had pronounced calf muscles. This was very, like, in-depth, I feel. Um, pronounced calf muscles consistent with someone who regularly wore boots or shoes with heels or performed ballet. He was dressed in a white shirt with a red and blue tie, brown trousers, socks and shoes, a brown knitted pullover and a fashionable grey and brown double-breasted jacket that seemed to be made by an American tailor based on the style. Excuse the noise I'm about to make, but I just realised I put the seatbelt on again even though oh, we're not going anywhere. Every time he gets in the car. Um, now, all the labels on this man's clothes had been cut off or removed. And he had no wallet or hat, which was apparently... And also, that is a little bit strange, I think, because back then a lot of people, as far as I recall, wrote their names on the tags or we stuck their that. names onto them. So I think it's very strange that they're cut off. Mm -hmm. You're getting ahead of yourself now. I am faster than these investigators. <laughs> um, so we'll kind of touch on what you just said there um, further on in the research. <laughs> so he had no hat either, which was apparently unusual for the time. Um, I suppose 1940s, they, there would have been a lot of, a hats. Lot of hats. It was a very um, hatty time. Very hatty time. People liked a hat. Um, the man was also clean shaven and as he carried no ID on him, this led police to speculate that he had committed suicide. What about the tags, investigators? No, so his dental records were checked but were not able to be matched to any known person. The pathologist estimated time of death to be around 2am on December 1st and said, quote, The heart was of normal size and normal in every way. Small vessels not commonly observed in the brain were easily discernible with congestion. There was congestion of the pharynx and the gullet was covered with whitening of superficial layers of oh, the no, mucosa. Oh, no, my God, a gullet. Um, your gullet, I think it's something to do with your stomach. Makes sense. That sounds like a stomachy thing. Yeah, like I've heard people refer to your stomach as your gullet, but I don't know if that's what that is. Um, yeah, or just something down there. Probably should have looked into that. Um, so the gullet was covered... Excuse me? The gullet was covered <laughs> with whitening of superficial layers of the mucosa with a patch of ulceration in the middle of it. The stomach was deeply congested, congested. There was congestion in the second half of the duodenum. There was blood mixed with food in the stomach. Mo both kidneys were congested, uh, congested and the liver contained a great excess of blood in its vessels. Okay. The spleen was strikingly large, about three times normal size. There was destruction of the centre of the liver lobules revealed under the microscope. Acute gastritis hemorrhage, extensive congestion of the liver and spleen and the congestion to the brain. End quote. So a lot of bad bouts. <laughs> Bad, bad A stuffs. lot, a lot had happened inside this man's body. Um, the autopsy also showed that the man had eaten a pasty about three to four hours before his death. What's a pasty? Um, a pasty, like a... Like a sausage roll or something? Like a, like a pasty. Like it's a pastry type thing. Let me just show you a pasty. Like that. A pasty, a pasty is a British baked pastry, a traditional variety of which is particularly associated with Cornwall. So oh, okay. It's like a Cornish pasty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, really showing our vegan and vegetarianism there. Um, the so the autopsy also showed that he'd eaten a paste a pasty about three to four hours before his death. Which probably made them think he was he was even British or -er. a British or -er. Um, and testing failed to reveal any foreign substances in his body. Patho pathologist Dr. Dwyer concluded, quote, I am, not, I am quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic, end quote. While poison remained the prime suspicion, the pasty is not believed to have been the source. Other than this, uh, sorry, other than this speculation, the pathologist was not able to determine a concrete cause of death confirm his identity or whether the man who had been seen alive at the beach by witnesses was the Somerton man as nobody had seen his face. The body was embalmed on December 10th 1948 due to police being unable to identify him and police said this was the first time they knew of such action needing to be taken. On January 14th 1949 so we're over a month from when his body was discovered now Staff at the Adelaide Railway Station uncovered a brown suitcase that had had its label removed and had been checked into the station. Did you look at that? Another removed label. Suspicious. Why would you remove the label and leave the fucking suitcase, though? I don't know. Um, and this had been checked into the station's cloakroom sometime after 11am on November 30th, 1948, so the day before the man's body was found. It was believed to belong to the Somerton man, and the case contained a red checked dressing gown, pyjamas a size 7 pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, shaving things, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, 
an electrician screwdriver, a table knife that had been cut down into a short, sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc believed to have been used as a protective sheath for the knife and the scissors, and a stenciling brush similar to those used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Imagine having nothing left except for a suitcase and a nickname given to you by people you don't even know because you're dead. Yeah, like it's... And it's scary how many cases there are out there of people who are yet to be identified. Yeah, like James and Johns. Yeah. Um, and they all have, like, a lot of them have been given, like, nicknames based on where they were found or identifying features or identifying markers because there are so many Jane and John Doe's out there. Yeah. That's um, crazy. Like, even, like, the boy in the box. I was about to say something really stupid. Oh, God, what were you going to say? Actually, has that identity come out yet? Um, an identity has been released, but it's not been 100% verified. Okay. Um, which is why I'm kind of like, that is a case I do want to cover, and I do fully intend to cover it. But, but we're I stalling am, the ball until there's yeah, as much like, as because, we can on newer developments. Because his identity was only released in the last, like, two, three months. I want to wait until there's much, like, more... Until it's more concrete. Until and it's more concrete and there's more information. What the why? fuck was that? Was that? Your, I thought it was your phone. Uh, no, I think it was my vape. I'm actually going to end myself. <laughs> Bit dramatic, Josh. No, it's really not. Well, yeah, it is. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, <laughs> no, I think it fell down the other side. Oh, God. Even. Guys, apologies for this ruckus. I'm just going to pause while Josh is looking for his... Um, and I'm his going vape. to pause the recording, actually. <laughs> Talk to you in what will be seven seconds. Mimer's not going. Yeah, it did. Okay, now it started again. <laughs> Whoops, I'm going to stop it again. Okay, see you soon. Again. So, in the search for my vape, we found an empty disposable vape box and a full packet of tux. Mm -hmm. As you may hear, the wrapper going. Tanya is very excited about this discovery. And no, they're not vegan, no, they're not I don't vegan. think. There's milk in them and there's wheat in them. I don't mind the wheat. I can I can build a bridge with the wheat allergy, but the veganism is where I draw the line. Sorry, guys. I don't like eating on microphone, but I'm starving. How's that? They're fucking banging. Sweet I can't chili lie. tux didn't exist before I was um, oh, vegan. Or at least I, I didn't know of them. Cannot fucking lie. Mm -hmm. I really need to get sweet chilli nuts, actually, from Tesco again. Well, Tesco's closed, hon. Well, no, I didn't necessarily mean now. Um, okay. Hang on, let me hydrate. Hydrate. With actual... You don't want to look like that piece of skin strapped to a square metal frame in Doctor Who. Oh, my God. What was that thing called again? I can't remember. Angela? No. No. She had a um, really fancy name and she was a bitch. I just, I just remember, what was it? Moisturise me. Yeah, that one. <laughs> she had a really normal name, I'm sure. Like a fancy name, but a normal name. Um, Angelica. I think Lady Cassandra O'Brien. Who the fuck is Angelica? Um, Angelica's from um, Rugrats, I think. But I also think you were thinking of um, that lady in Doctor Who in like one of the first seasons that got turned into a fucking paving stone. Um, the girl who played her was in Harry Potter. Um, Harry Potter, Harry Potter. Ron she Weasley. Was moaning, she was moaning Myrtle in Harry Potter. Oh. And I actually watched a movie recently that she was also in. I've really gone off topic here. Hang on. Um, she was in Train Spotting. I don't remember seeing her in Train Spotting. Is that um, the drug thing? Yeah, it's actually really, really good. I watched it for the first time recently. Um, well, for the first time in years. Um, sorry, this is going to bug me for the rest of the podcast if I don't do it right now. <laughs> the so. rest of my life. Yep. Wait, what is it you're looking up again? <clears throat> Who she was in Doctor Who. Ursula. Ursula Blake. Ursula. Um... Let me actually show you because you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I show you. So I hope you guys watch <laughs> Doctor Who. <laughs> actually, I must check his back yet. <laughs> she got turned into a paving stone. Oh, I and remember that. her boyfriend that. kept her. I, you say that as if you disagree, but I, I think you'd be very annoyed if Justin gave you away just because you turned into a paving stone. I mean, I would be salty as fuck and I would ruin his life with my... I, I don't know how I would, but I would ruin his life somehow. But <laughs> um, For what I'm about to say, if you were... To, well, listener discretion is advised. Oh, God. You'd be a stone fleshlight. Oh, my God, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Ursula was a stone flesh <laughs> Anyway, sorry about that. Let's get back to the case. Back to the topic. 
So in addition to everything that I mentioned before we went on a tangent, um, the investigators... Tangent of the talks. <laughs> yeah. The investigators also found a thread card of barber orange waxed thread. This was an unusual type of thread and it was not available in Australia. And it was also the same type of thread. Was it by any chance available in Britain? <clears throat> I don't know, but I assume so. <laughs> And it was also the same type of thread that was used to repair the lining in the pocket of the trousers the dead man had been wearing when he was found. Now, all identifying tags on the clothes had been removed. Shock horror. But police found the name T. Keen on a tie, on a tie Keen on a laundry bag, and Keen spelled K-E-A-N without the E. Um, at, so, sorry, let me backtrack. So T. Keen and Keen found on the tie in the laundry bag Keen was spelled K-E-A-N-E. <clears throat> Very Irish. Um, but here we say Keen. But mm. I think it is Keen. What? Um, like the surname. Like we, there is someone in town. I'm not going to say the name on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like their surname is Keen. And it's spelled K-E-A-N-E. The only ones I know are that's pronounced Keens. Oh, the, he, that's the only person that I know but it, that it's spelled that way. So yeah, I was thinking it was pronounced Keen. But that person I know it's Keen. Um, <clears throat> but anyway... So Keen on an undershirt was also found, but it was spelled K-E-A-N. Without E. Without the E at the end. Um, as well as this, there was three dry cleaning marks found on the clothes. And these were 1171 slash 7, 4393 slash 7 and 3053 slash 7. Now, investigators believed that whoever had removed the tags from these clothes had either overlooked these three items or had intentionally left the Keen tags knowing it was not the dead man's name. Now, as wartime rationing was still in place and clothing was somewhat difficult to get, it wasn't uncommon for people to use name tags, as you said earlier. Um. And when you would buy, when buying secondhand clothes, you would remove the previous owner's name tags. It was thought to be unusual as well that the man had no spare socks or any form of correspondence in his suitcase. Despite what does correspondence mean? <clears throat> Excuse me, like letters or anything. Oh, okay, right. I thought it was supposed to be some sort of slang for underwear or something. Seems around the topic of socks. <laughs> no, there was four pairs and of I underwear. Was like, there was four yeah. pairs of underwear, but there was no spare socks for some reason. But he was wearing socks when he was found, so he was obviously just wearing the one pair of socks, bless him. They stole his name tags and his socks. Oh my God, they stole his socks. Um. Now, despite him having... <gasps> Conspiracy theory. Didn't sometimes people have their like um, initials branded onto socks back then, especially? So he could have just taken the socks because they had the it's, initials sewed into them. It's possible, but there was no initials on the socks that he was found wearing. That's why they weren't taken. Oh. <laughs> That's why they didn't take those socks. Um, now, he had no correspondence in his suitcase, despite police finding pencils and unused letter stationery. Investigators' searches revealed that there was no missing persons relating to T. Keen in any English-speaking country, and a nationwide search regarding the dry cleaning marks also turned up nothing of note. The only evidence that they could put together from the suitcase was that the front gusset and feather stitching found on a coat in it pointed to it having been manufactured in the USA. Okay, again, what's a gusset? Um, it's like the front part of the... Um, coat i think the only like listen look i'm sorry the only context that i know for gusset is that in women's underwear there's like a weird little pocket in the crotch and that's called a gusset so the gusset is probably the it's something to do with the seam actually oh sorry it's something to do with the seam Interesting. <coughs> excuse me so the coat had not been imported indicating that the somerton man had either been to the u.s or had bought the coat from someone who had been to the u.s now, after checking train records, investigators began to believe that the man had arrived at the Adelaide Railway Station via an overnight train from Melbourne, Sydney or Port Augusta. They think he showered and shaved at the adjacent city baths, so the city baths that were across from the train station Is in that, Adelaide. Is like public bathrooms? You would think that, but no, it was actually a public swimming pool. Okay, but I hope had... people didn't use them as a bath. <laughs> But they obviously had showering facilities and bathing and facilities. And whatnot, yeah. Um, now, there was no baths ticket found with his body. And after, it's assumed that after he went and showered and shaved, he returned to the station to buy a ticket for the 10 to 11 morning train to Henley Beach, which for unknown reasons he had missed. He checked his suitcase in at the station cloakroom before leaving and getting a city bus to Glenelg, which was where Somerton Beach was. Um, investigators noted that I think the it's really weird he was going to a beach yeah like or at least an area called Henley Beach so I'm assuming there's a beach yeah and then 
was found dead on a beach. Yeah, it's a very strange. Just not the beach area he was en route to, well, hoping to get to. Yeah. Um, now, investigators noted that the railway station did have bathing facilities near the cloakroom. Um, and it was it was not unavailable for any reason on the day that the Somerton man arrived, but he instead chose to use the facilities at the swimming pool. Now, Coroner Thomas Erskine Cleland was tasked with conducting an inquest into the Somerton man's death, and this began a few days after finding his body, but it ended up being adjourned until June 17th, 1949. Now, I don't know why that is, but it was adjourned. When the inquest began again, and Cleland was re-examining the body, he made a few new discoveries. He noted that the Somerton man's shoes were very clean and seemed to have been polished recently. This was unusual given the man had supposedly wandered around Glenelg all day and added that, and the coroner added that this would fit his theory that the body was brought to the beach after the man's death, which was something that would account for lack of evidence of vomiting or convulsions, which are two of the main physiological reactions to poisoning. <clears throat> now, Cleland posited, such a fancy word, that because none of the victims... Sorry, none of the witnesses could positively identify the man as the same person who was found dead the next morning. There remained a possibility that the man had, had been killed or had died somewhere else and was dumped on the beach. Though he did stress that this was just a theory as all the witnesses firmly believed it was definitely the same person due to the body being found in the same place and position as they had seen him. Cleland also could not find any evidence to indicate the dead man's identity. Now, Professor Cedric Stanton Hicks, who was a professor of physiology, sorry, physi Physiolo why, phys physiology, why can't I talk? Physiology and pharmacology at the University of Adelaide stated that in regards to a particular group of drugs, variants of a drug that he referred to as number one, and particularly drug number two, would be extremely toxic in a, in a relatively small oral dose and would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to identify even if it was suspected in the first place. <coughs> Hicks wrote down the names of these drugs and passed the information to Cleland, who entered it into evidence as Exhibit C-18. Now, at the time of the investigation, these drugs would have been considered, quote, quite easily procurable by the ordinary individual, end quote, from a chemist without any need to give a reason for your purchase. So the names of the drugs were not released to the public until the 1980s when they were identified as Digitalis and I think it's Uabane. Where is this? This one, Uabane. O-U-A-B-A-N. I would say that Uabane or Aubane. Uabane or Aubane. Um, but I have also have no fucking clue. <laughs> now, who knows, maybe it's Wabon. <laughs> Wabon. These are two cardinalide type cardiac glycosides, a class which is a class of organic compounds that increase the output force of the heart. At least it's organic. Uh, which increase the output force of the heart while decreasing its rate of contractions. Now, Hicks said that the only fact not found in relation to the body was evidence of vomiting. He then said its absence was not unknown but he could not make a frank conclusion without it. And that he also said that if death had occurred seven hours after the man was last seen to move, it would imply he had received a massive dose that could still have been impossible to, dete to detect. It was also noted by Hicks that the last known movement seen by witnesses at 7pm could have been the last convulsion before death. Early on in the inquiry, Cleland said, quote, I would be prepared to find that he died from poison that the poison was probably a glucoside and that it was not accidentally administered. But I cannot say whether it was administered by the deceased himself or by some other person, end quote. Now, despite his findings, Cleland could not definitively determine the Somerton man's cause of death. And he remarked that if the body had been carried to its final resting place, then all of the difficulties would disappear. After the inquest was concluded, a plaster cast was made of the man's head and shoulders. Knees and toes, knees and toes. <clears throat> Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, and eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so a plaster cast was made of the man's head and shoulders, not his knees and toes. Just to clarify. <laughs> um, <laughs> the lack of success in finding the man's identity and cause of death had led investigators to dub it an unparalleled mystery and led to them believing the cause of death would never be known. Around the same time as the inquest, a tiny piece of rolled up paper was found in a fob pocket sewn into the man's trouser pocket. It read, to ma'am should. 
Public library officials were called in to translate the text and they identified it as meaning ended or finished. And it was That's a f- marvelous. <clears throat> and it was a phrase found at the end of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. The back side of the paper that's a poem, by the way. Okay. Um the back side of the paper was blank and police conducted an Australia wide search in attempts to find a copy of the book that also had a blank verso as they called it, which is just a fancy way of saying the reverse of the paper or the back of the paper. Um, and they also released a photo of the scrap of paper to the press. After the police's ap- public appeal, the book which the scrap of paper had been torn from was found. A man came forward to show police a 1941 copy of Edward Fitzgerald's 1859 translation of Rubaiyat, which had been published by Whitcomb and Tombs in Christchurch, New Zealand. Now, this is actually considered to be a rare edition because the translation in this edition differs from other Fitzgerald translations. Okay. <clears throat> So he had a rare copy of the book. Um, Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean, who was leading the investigation, often protected witnesses' privacy by using pseudonyms. And he referred to this man, the man who handed in the book and who had found the book, as Ronald Francis. This is the only name that we know this man by, and it is said that he had not considered that the book might be connected to the case until he had seen an article in the previous day's newspaper. Now, a bus conductor by the name of Leslie Francis Whitkin, or Whitkins, handed in a copy of the Rubaiyat to the Metropolitan Tramways Trust around this time, and it is speculated that this could have been Ronald Francis, I suppose Leslie Francis Whitkin or Whitkins, Ronald Francis. Um, There are different reports as to how the book was found. Some sources say it was found around a week or two before the Somerton man's body was found. Former detective Jerry Feltus, who worked the case as a cold case, said it was found just after the man who was found at the beach at Somerton. Now, the timing is significant because the man is presumed, based on the suitcase, to have arrived in Adelaide the day before he was found at the beach. So if the book was found before his death, it would suggest the man had previously visited Adelaide or had been there for longer than investigators initially believed or mm-hmm. thought. Most accounts say the book was found in an unlocked car parked in Jetty Road in Glenelg on either the back seat or the rear floor well. Now, I'm more inclined to believe that this bus driver maybe picked it up on a bus because I did see that there was bus tickets found in the Somerton man's pockets as yeah. well. And I suppose he would have handed it into the Lost and Found or the Tramway Trust or whatever. And then when seeing the... Like, if I find a book, I'm going to flip through the book. See, yeah. See if there's anything in it. You know, be nosy. So I'm my belief is that he noticed that there was a bit missing off that back page and handed it in and then thought of it when he saw it in the newspaper and went and got it and handed it to the police. Yeah, that would be the most logical explanation. <clears throat> Now, in terms of the book, the theme of Rubaiyat is that one should live life to its fullest and have no regrets when it ends. The subject matter of the poem led, like, further led police to believe the man had taken his own life with poison, but mm. none of the evidence corroborated this theory. The book found and handed over to police was missing the words to mam should, which had a blank back. Um, so the page had a blank back as well. Sorry, a blank verso. Um... And microscopic tests showed the piece of paper in the man's pocket was from the page torn from the book. In the back of the book, investigators found faint indentations of five lines of text in capital letters. The second line had been struck out, and this was considered to be an error in encryption, as it was very similar to the fourth line of text. Now, the text reads as follows, line by line. W-R-G-O-A-B-A-B-D And then the second line, which was struck out, was M-L-I-A-O-I. The third line was W-T-B-I-M-P-A-N-E-T-P. Below that, there is an X with a line through it. Um, And then under that, the fourth line, we'll say, is M-L-I-A-B-O-A-I-A-Q-C. And the final line is I T T. M T S A M S T G A B. What? Yeah. I have six words, six letters. Okay. W T F D T M. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I got the what the fuck, and then I was like, does that mean? Uh, I don't know. To this day, it's not been solved. It's not been cracked. Um, now I will be explaining further about it. So in the book, it is unclear whether the first letter is a W or an M, um, but it is believed it's more likely to be a W when it's compared to the M that is stricken out in the second line. 
The letters were initially thought to be the words, sorry, to be words written in a foreign language before it was realised to be a code. Code experts were called in to decipher it but were unsuccessful as were many amateurs who also attempted to crack it. In 1978, journalist... You ready for this name? Go on. Stuart Littlemore. Just got rid of the more and it's... Every time this man came up in the research, my brain was picturing Stuart Little. Yeah. So Stuart Littlemore, who worked for ABC Television, requested that the Department of Defence Cryptographers analyse the handwritten text. So they did. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm slurring my words and stumbling over my words and I don't know why. It's probably the amount of coffee that I've drank today, but... I don't think you are. Actually... On that note, more iced coffee. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, it's so good. So the cryptographers stated that it would be impossible to provide a satisfactory answer as if the text was an encrypted message, it didn't have enough symbols and it was too short to provide a clear meaning. And also they said that that the text could very well be, quote, the meaningless product of a disturbed mind. Okay. Just gibberish. In 2004, retired detective Jerry Feltus suggested to the Sunday Mail that the final line, I-T-T-M-T-S-A-M-S-T-G-A-B, could mean it's time to move to South Australia, Mosley Street. Now, the T-G-A-B, don't know what that could be, he never said. Um, where was I? Jessica Thompson, who we will speak mo- speak about more in just a few minutes, lived in Mosley Street, which is the main road through Glen- Glenelg. From 2009 to 2011, Derek Abbott, um, who we will also speak more about later, and his team concluded each letter was most likely the first letter of a work and an analysis carried out by computational linguist John... Re- sorry, of a word. And an anal- analysis carried out by computational linguist John Railing in 2014 strongly supports the theory that the letters consist of the initials of some English text but could find no match for these in a large survey of literature. He concluded that the letters are likely some form of shorthand and the original text will never be determined. Now, Jessica Thompson. What shorthand? Uh, shorthand is like... Your own abbreviation. Your own abbreviation. Personal to you. Yeah. Yeah. So like journalists would write in shorthand to make it easier to record interviews and things. Yeah. Um... Now, so Jessica Thompson and Alf Boxall is where we're going next. So another thing found in the back of the Rubaiyat was a phone number belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Thompson, known as Jo. And I'm going to be referring to her as Jo. Mm-hmm. Jo was born Jessica or Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb Harkness. of... Harkness. I know, I thought the same. That's another Doctor Who reference if you don't oh, know. Oh, I was thinking of the Umbrella Academy. Oh, see, I was thinking of Captain Jack Harkness. There's that as well. Anyway, um, so Joe was born Jessica or Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Marrickville, New South Wales. And she lived in Mosley Street uh, in Glenelg, which was only about 400 metres or 1,300 feet feet north of where the Somerton man's body had been found. When Joe was interviewed by police, she said that she didn't know the the deceased or why he would have her phone number or choose to visit the area where she lived on the night of his death. However, she also reported in late 1948 that an unknown man had attempted to visit her home and had asked her neighbour about her. When Jo was shown the plaster cast of the dead man by Detective Lean in 1949, she said she couldn't identify the person depicted, but according to Lean, she seemed, quote, completely taken aback to the point of giving her the appearance that she was about to faint, end quote. Paul Lawson, who had made the cast, stated in an interview years later, that after looking at the bust, Joe looked away immediately and would not look at it again. <clears throat> Joe also stated that while she had been working at Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's going on with my voice this evening, um, in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of Rubaiyat, but that she had given, given it to an Australian Army lieutenant named Alf Boxall in 1945 at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney. At the time, Alf Boxall was serving in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Jo told police that after the war had ended, she had moved to Melbourne and gotten married. She also said that she had received one letter from Alf and that she had responded informing him she was now married and there is no evidence of him contacting her after this point. I would like to note 
that research does suggest that her husband, Prosper Thompson, was in the process of divorcing his first wife in 1949 and did not marry Jo until 1950. And records also show that her son, Robin Thompson, was born in July 1947, at which point she was unmarried. I wonder if there's something man the father of a child. We'll touch on that. We'll touch on that. Because why would you go white and look like you're about to faint? Yes. Like, um, obviously, I know it's not a nice thing to see, but yeah. when it's a cast and it's not like you're seeing an actual image, unless it's someone you recognise or know... Why would you react that way? Why would you way? react that way? Maybe she was of a weak constitution, but I think being a nurse... Do you know what I mean? And You've seen things, I'd imagine. Worked, having worked during World War Two. Yeah. Now, police... Where am I... Oh yeah, so accounts between Jessica and police show that she told them she was married or recently married in 1945, but I found no records of a first husband in my research. Um, now I'll touch on my theory regarding this later on. Mm-hmm. Police suspected after meeting with Joe that Alf Boxall could be the Somerton man, but Boxall was later found alive in Sydney in 1949 with his copy of Rubaiyat intact and unaware of any links between himself and the dead man. On the front of the copy of Rubaiyat that Joe had given to Alf, Joe, who was Jessica Harkness at the time, had signed herself as Jestin and written out verse 70, which reads, quote, Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before. I swore, but was I sober when I swore? And then, and then came spring and rose in hand. My threadbare, my threadbare penitent, penitence a pieces tore. I totally know what any of that meant. Me either. Um... I am just checking to make sure I didn't skip a bit. I didn't. Um, so, in Jerry Feltis's book, he states that when he interviewed Jo in 2002, he felt that she was either being evasive or she simply didn't want to speak of the matter. Feltis believed that Jo knew the Somerton man's identity and Jo's daughter Kate said in an interview with Channel 9's 60 Minutes in 2014 that she also believed her mother knew the dead man. During the original investigation in 1949, Joe had asked police not to keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to any third parties as it would be, quote, embarrassing and harmful to her reputation to be linked to such a case, end quote. The police agreed and it said that this was something that later hampered the case. In the media, Joe was referred to by pseudonyms such as Jestin or Teresa Johnson Nay Powell. In 2010, Jerry Feltis stated that he was given permission by Joe's family to disclose her and her husband's real names, but he still chose to use pseudonyms um, in his book and stated that her family did not know of her connection with the case, um, and he agreed not to disclose her name or anything that might reveal it. Now, this was because her name was considered important, as it was believed to potentially be the decryption key for the code. Right. Um, now, in terms of... Potential identifications. Where did they get the notion that she'd be the code cracker? Um, well, I suppose the fact that her number was in the back of the book and he had been found so close to her home and there was reports of an unidentified man poking around her house, trying to visit her, asking her neighbours about her. Investigators probably concluded that there was some kind of a link there and then with her reaction to the plaster cast and everything like that, it just, I suppose they were trying to be cautious. Mm. So in terms of early reported identifications and kind of potential identifications, over the last 70 years, and yes, I said 70 years. So seven long, like, that's a zero, Seven zero. Many potential identifications have been put forward, so we're going to get into that now. On December 2nd, 1948, newspaper The Advertiser named the man as E.C. Johnson. But on December 3rd, the next day, E.C. Johnson presented himself at a police station very much alive. Also on December 3rd, um, a newspaper called The News, very original, mm-hmm. published a photo of the man on its front page, which led to calls from the public about his possible identity. By December 4th, it was announced that the man's fingerprints were not on any records. And on December 5th, the advertiser announced that police were searching through military records after a man made claims that he had drank with a person resembling the Somerton man at a hotel in Glenelg on November 13th. He also said that during this time, the man had produced a military pension card with the name Solomonson on it. 
In early January 1949, two people identified the body as 63-year-old former woodcutter Robert Walsh. A third person by the name of James Mack had also viewed the body but initially could not identify it. An hour later, Mack contacted police again to claim it was actually Robert Walsh, but that he had not realised it at first due to a difference in the hair colour. Robert Walsh had left Adelaide many months earlier to go by sheep in Queensland, but had not returned for Christmas as he had planned before his departure. Police were were sceptical of this identification due to Robert Walsh being in his 60s and the coroner estimating the Somerton man to be in his 40s, but did say that that the body was consistent with someone who had worked as a woodcutter, although the examination of his hands indicated he would not have cut wood for at least 18 months prior to his death. Any hopes of a positive identification were dashed when Elizabeth Thompson, there's a lot of Thompsons in this case, but they're all spelled differently. None of them are actually related. Um, Elizabeth Thompson, who was one of the people who had earlier identified the body as Walsh, retracted her identification after a second viewing, where she had noted the absence of a scar on the man's body, as well as the size of the man's legs, leading her to realise it was not Robert Walsh. By early 1949, there had been eight different positive identifications of the body, including two men from Darwin who thought it was a friend of theirs and others who thought it was a missing... How are all these people thinking it's someone they know that's dead when it's not the person they think it is? Honestly. How well do you know your friends? I was reading this and I was like, so you you don't know what your friends look like? Don't get me wrong, I know they must have been a bit out of shape or whatever because they're dead. Yeah. But, like, I think if someone called me down to a station to give an identification for, like, fucking you or something, I would know if it was you or not. You wouldn't have to be like... She's got a tattoo of Medusa on her sternum. Can you just whip out her dead her? tits there? Whip out, her t- whip out her titties there and just let me see. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. To be fair, like I think it's not something that would happen these days. No, I don't know how it happened those days. Because <laughs> um, like, it's nothing to do with technology. It's your in, eyesight. Me going in. I think that's Josh. There's a there's a marketing idea there for spec savers. <laughs> Should have gone to spec savers. Um and others who thought it was a missing station worker. A worker on a steamship or a Swedish man. I read that, it was so weird. Let me backtrack. So there was two men from Darwin who thought it was a friend of theirs. Yeah. Some other people thought it was a missing station worker. Some other people thought it was a missing worker on a steamship. And then someone else believed it was a missing Swedish man. Detectives in Victoria believed the man could be from there due to similarities between the laundry marks found on his clothes and those used by dry cleaners in the Victoria area. He was also at one point believed to be a seaman named Robert... (laughs) Jesus Christ, I can't talk! I can't talk! Believed to be a seaman named Tommy Reed, who was missing from the SS cycle, but after the body was viewed by some of his shipmates, they stated that the body was absolutely not Tommy. By November 1953... See, they know their friend. They know what Tommy looks like. Um, so That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> November 1953, which is... November when? 53. 53, 70 years Four ago. Four years later. Oh, sorry, I was doing that in the wrong way. <laughs> no. So by November 1953, four years after the discovery of the body, police announced that they had received 251... The word they used was solutions to the dead man's identity. <laughs> Not one of them solved up. No, okay. In the space of four years, 251 different identities were put forward and none of them were him. More like um, different theories. Yeah, but the only clue of any value remained the clothes the man had been wearing. A connection between the Somerton man and the death of a two-year-old boy six months later was considered. On June 6th, 1949, the body of two-year-old Clive Magnuson was found in a sack in the Largs Bay Sandhills, which is about... So sad. It's horrible, honestly. Um, which was about 20 kilometres or 12 miles up the coast from Somerton Park Beach. Lying next to Clive was the unconscious body of his father, Keith Waldemar Magnuson. Keith was taken to hospital in a very weak condition and suffered from exposure. After he was examined, he was transferred to a mental hospital. Exposure, as in just being out in the elements too yeah. long, like? Exposure, okay. because they were missing for um, four days. So the Magnusons had been missing for four days, and it was believed that Clive had been dead for around 24 hours when he and his father were found by Neil McRae, who claimed he had seen their location in a dream the night before. 
<laughs> I was about to say, yeah. don't you tell me on a GPS, because you didn't have them. <laughs> um, so the coroner was unable to determine Clive's cause of death and sent his stomach contents to a government analyst for further Could examination. Could you imagine being the person who has looked through people's stomach contents? Yeah, that's disgusting. Yuck. Um, but after, fair play to those of you that do, because yeah, someone has to. Someone has to. Um, after Clive's death, his mother, Roma Magnuson, reported that she had been threatened by a masked man who had almost run her down in a battered cream-coloured car outside her home in Cheapside Street, Largs North. <laughs> I swear, Cheapside Street. It's named Cheapside Street. Where's Richside Street? I want to go there. Roma said, quote, the car stopped and a man with a khaki handkerchief over his face told her to, quote, keep away from the police or else. Now, a similar looking man had been, apparently been spotted lurking around the house. And Roma believed that this was all due to her husband's attempts to identify the Somerton man. Keith believed the Somerton man to be someone named Carl Thompson, another Thompson, unrelated, who he had worked with in Renmark in 1939. Soon after her police interview, Roma Magnuson collapsed and needed medical treatment. J.M. Gower, who was secretary of the Largs North Progress Association, received anonymous phone calls threatening Roma stating that she would meet with an accident if he interfered and the acting mayor of Port Adelaide at the time, A.H. Curtis, had three phone calls threatening an accident if he stuck his nose into the Magnuson affair. Uh, police police believed, believed the, ho- the calls were a hoax and that the caller was likely the same culprit who had terrorised a woman in a nearby suburb after she had recently lost her husband in tragic circumstances. Jesus Christ. Yeah, so I don't know for sure if that's linked. Um, that is something that I meant to look into and then forgot about. Because what a decent human, though. So someone long. just lost their husband and you're terrorising them. But it's like um, when someone goes missing or someone dies. And you and get, you get those, those fake tips. Or yeah, I you saw get those them shitty people, people commenting. People pretend to be them, yeah. like with the Brian Schaefer case. Yeah. And someone posted a line on the obituary. Yes. Saying, love you, dad, or something like yeah. that. Like, and it's saying that he was be, in the US Virgin Islands. You have to be the lowest form of human to do something like that to a family that is suffering the way these families suffer. Now, in 1949, the Somerton man's body was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery with a service conducted by the Salvation Army. The South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save him from a pauper's burial. Years later, flowers began to appear on the grave and police questioned a woman who was seen leaving the graveyard but she claimed to know nothing of the man. Around the same time, Ina Harvey... A I bet she was a Thompson as well at this probably. point. Probably. Um, so around the same time, Ina Harvey, a receptionist at the Strathmore Hotel across from the Adelaide railway station, said that a strange man had stayed in either room 21 or room 23 for a few days around the time... <laughs> Both the numbers of the houses I've lived in, that's yep. okay. <laughs> for a few days, maybe you were the Somerton man past life um for a few days around well, the time, that ended on a high note didn't it <laughs> for a few days around the time of the somerton man's death and had checked out on november 30th 1948 she recalled him as english speaking and carrying only a small black case similar to what a musician or a doctor might carry and when an employee looked inside the case he told Ina that he had seen an object that looked like a needle on November 22nd, 1959, it was reported that E.B. Collins, who was an inmate at Whanganui Prison in New Zealand, knew the identity of the dead man. In 1994, John Harbour Phillips, Chief, Chief Justice of Victoria... <laughs> Chief bastard! <laughs> Chief, Justice, uh, Chief Justice of Victoria and Chairman of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine reviewed the case to try and determine a cause of death and concluded, quote, There seems little doubt it was digitalis. He, he supported this conclusion by pointing out that the deceased's organs were engorged, which is consistent with digitalis poisoning, um, as well as the lack of evidence of natural death. And so the, is digitalis a type of poisoning or a type of poison to be poisoned with? A type of poison. I mentioned it earlier. Come on, Josh. Focus. There's a lot going on. <laughs> um, as well as the lack of evidence of natural death and the absence of anything seen macroscopically, which could account for the death. The South Australian Police Historical Society holds possession of the plaster plaster bust or the plaster cast of the man's face, um, head, mm-hmm. face and shoulders. Not knees and toes. Um, yes, which does contain some strands of his hair. But unfortunately, any other attem- attempts to identify him have been kind of hampered due to the formaldehyde used in the embalming process, destroying much of the Somerton man's DNA. That was intelligent. The brown suitcase was destroyed in 1986. What, as in like incinerated or something? Yep. That was also intelligent. Yep. 
and witness statements. Hey, evidence. Let's burn it. Mm-hmm. And witness statements have gone missing from the police file over the years. Okay, this is getting weird now. Now, I will say... It was 40, almost 40 years later when the suitcase was destroyed. And this case has been ongoing for 70 years. So it's not uncommon for bits of evidence to kind of disappear and go missing and be misplaced. No, but come on. I know, it's annoying. It's annoying. Now, let me hydrate before we get on to the theories. Like, especially if the case is going on that long. Put the evidence somewhere, leave it there and don't come back. Put it somewhere safe. Yeah. Um. Now, the first theory... <clears throat> Is the spy theory. Espionage 101. Mm-hmm. There has been much speculation over the years that the Somerton man was a spy. This is due to the circumstances and historical context of his death. At least two sites that we know of are relatively close to Adelaide and were of interest to spies. And these were the Radium Hill Uranium Mine and the Woomera Test Range, which was an Anglo-Australian military research facility. The man's death also coincided with the reorganisation of Australian security agencies and with the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, or ASIO, being founded a year after the Subberton man's discovery. And this was this founding was followed with a crackdown on Soviet espionage in Australia, which was revealed by intercepts of Soviet communications under the Verona Project. Another theory involved Alf Boxall, who was who I mentioned earlier, yeah. um, who was supposedly involved in intelligence work during and immediately after World War Two. When interviewed by Stuart Littlemore in 1978, Littlemore asked, quote, Mr. Boxall, you had been working, hadn't you, in an intelligence unit before you met this young woman, Jessica Harkness slash Thompson? And um, did you talk to her about that at all? Boxall replied with no, and when Littlemore asked if Jessica Harkness or Joe Thompson could have known um, about Boxall's work, Boxall said, not unless somebody else told her. Littlemore asked Boxall if there could have been an espionage connection to the Somerton man, and Boxall said, quote, it's quite a melodramatic thesis, isn't it? That's Box- not a no. Mm-hmm. Boxall's army service record suggests that he had been he had begun serving initially in the Fourth Water Transport Company, before being seconded to the North Australian Observer Unit, or NAOU, which was a special operations unit. And during his time in the NAOU, he rose through the ranks rapidly, going from Lance Corporal to Lieutenant within the space of three months. Oh my. Mm -hmm. Now, the next theory is the H.C. Reynolds theory. In 2011, a woman from Adelaide contacted biological anthropologist Massiej Henberg about an ID card that she had found in her father's possessions. The ID card belonged to H.C. Reynolds and was a document issued to foreign seamen by the U.S. during World War One. You're going to laugh every time I say seamen, aren't you? That's why I'm trying to pronounce it like seamen instead of seamen. Um, Henberg received the card in October 2011 and compared the ID ID photo to photos of the Somerton man. Henberg found anatomical similarities in the nose, lips and eyes, but believed none to be as reliable as the close similarity of the ear. The ear shapes shared by both men were a very good match and additionally Henberg found what he called a unique identifier in the form of a mole on the cheek that was the same shape and in the same position on both men in the photographs. Okay. Henberg stated, quote, Together with the similarity of the ear car- characteristics, this mole in a forensic case would allow me to make a rare statement positively identifying the Somerton man. You know, it's the first time I've ever heard the words ear characteristics. Yeah. Um, The ID card bore the number 58757 and was issued in the US on February 28th, 1918 to H.C. Reynolds and listed his nationality as British and his age as 18. Searches were conducted in the US and UK National Archives as well as the Australian War Memorial Research Centre, but this failed to produce any records of H.C. Reynolds. Some independent researchers believe believe that H.C. Reynolds is Horace Charles Reynolds, a Tasmanian man who died in 1953, and so he could not be the Somerton man. Mm. Um, now, back to jumping back to Joe Thompson. Her husband, Prosper, passed. His name was Prosper. Was he Prosper? His name was Prosper Thompson. Prosper. Oh, his first name? His first name was Prosper. What the point? Is it? I'm assuming his parents had high hopes. <laughs> Our Prosper will prosper. 
So her husband Prosper Thompson passed away in 1995 and Joe Thompson passed away in 2007. In November 2013, three of the Thompson's relatives gave interviews on 60 Minutes. Kate Thompson, Joe and Prosper's daughter, stated that her mother was the woman interviewed by police in 1949 and that her mother had told her that she had lied to the police. Um, according to Kate, Joe did know the identity of the Somerton man and said that his identity, identity was also, quote, known to a level higher than the police force. Kate suggested that... I'm stuttering again. Kate suggested that both the Somerton man and her mother may have been spies, noting that her mother taught English to migrants, was interested in communism and spoke Russian, though she would never tell Kate where or why she had learned it. Roma Egan, the widow of Joe's son Robin, the one who was born in 1947, mm -hmm. um, and their daughter Rachel also appeared on 60 Minutes, where they stated their belief... 60 Minutes Australia? No. I like that. Where they stated their belief that the Somerton man was Robin's father and that Rach and Rachel's grandfather. They also said they had lodged a new application with Attorney General John Rao to have the Somerton man exhumed for DNA testing, but Kate Thompson opposed the exhumation as being disrespectful to her brother. Derek Abbott, who we'll get on to Wait, in a few minutes... Wait, what? I suppose speculating about his parents would have been disrespectful to him in her mind. Because I suppose as far as she was concerned, her dad was his dad. Because he was Robin Thompson. Wait, who was getting who was buried to be exhumed? The Somerton man. But yeah. she believed that exhuming the Somerton man in order to test his DNA against her niece would be disrespectful to her brother, who was her niece's father, and also who she believed to be her father's son. You at it? No, but go ahead because I don't think I'm going to get it. My brain is not my brain's not braining. Okay. I don't um, know why, but that specific paragraph yeah, just doesn't compute. Doesn't make sense to me either, but I suppose it's her personal belief. Yeah. Um But yeah. it's not even that I disagree with her or anything, I just don't understand. Yeah. Now Derek Abbott, um, who I mentioned earlier and who we will get into properly in a minute, um, also wrote to the Attorney General in support of Roma and Rachel saying that the exhumation for DNA testing would be consistent with federal government policy of identifying soldiers in war graves and bringing closure to their families. Now, when interest in the case resurfaced in October 2011, Attorney General Rao refused to exhume the body, saying, quote, there needs to be public interest reasons that go well beyond public curiosity or broad scientific interest. How about finding out what actually happened to someone who died yeah. and who they are for their own sake of... Now, Jerry Feltus said he was still being contacted by people in Europe who believed the man was a missing relative or friend, but didn't believe that exhuming and finding the man's family grouping would provide any answers to relatives as, quote, during that period, so many war criminals changed their names and came to different countries. Yeah, but at least I'd know their relative's dead. Honestly, this whole, like, that, that whole part of it just made no sense to me. In October 2018... There was a different Attorney General in charge, so Attorney General Vicky Chapman gave approval for the Somerton man to be exhumed in order to extract DNA for analysis. Go Vicky. With the parties interested in the analysis agreeing to cover the costs, and his potential granddaughter's DNA was to be compared to his to see if there would be a match. The exhumation took place on May 19th, 2021. Police said the body was in reasonable condition and they were optimistic about their prospects of recovering DNA. Dr. Anne Coxon of Forensic Science South Australia said, quote, The technology available to us now is clearly light years ahead of the techniques available when this body was discovered in the late 1940s. Yeah. And said that they would use every method at our disposal to try and bring some closure to this enduring mystery. Now we're getting on to Derek Abbott. In March 2009, Hi, Professor, Derek. Professor Derek Abbott of the University of Adelaide and his, and his team began to try solving the case by cracking the code found in the Rubaiyat, while also proposing that the body be exhumed for DNA. His investigations have led to some concerns regarding speculations and assumptions made by the original investigators. He also tracked down the barber waxed cotton thread of the period and discovered variations in packaging that could provide clues as to what country the thread found in the suitcase was bought in. Abbott's team determined that the letter frequency in the back of the Rubaiyat was considerably different to letters written down at random 
and the frequency was to be tested to see if the blood alcohol level of the writer could interfere with random distribution. So they wanted to be sure that it wasn't just random letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They noted that the format of the code also appeared to follow the quatrain form- format of Rubaiyat. Quatrain is a type of stanza, or it can be a complete poem consisting of four lines. So I think like a haiku. Okay. And this led to them thinking... Sorry, this led them to thinking that the code is a one-time pad encryption algorithm. Now, a one-time pad is an encryption encryption technique that can't be crapped, cracked. <laughs> I honestly can't speak tonight. Is it... <laughs> This is me every time, to be honest, give, anyway. Just, so. just, just give me a minute. Give me a minute to get the brain going again. <laughs> Thank you. That was very helpful. So, one-time pad is an encryption technique that can't be cracked without a single-use pre-shared key, usually longer than the message being sent. Abbott's team used computers to compare the code to copies of the Rubaiyat, the Talmud, and the Bible in order to get a statistical base for letter frequencies. However, due to the code being so short, the team would need the exact book the Somerton man had. But if you've, been, if you've been listening and following along, you'll know he had a rare copy and the original copy owned by him disappeared in the 1950s. The team concluded that each letter was the first letter of a word. An investigation showed... Oh, yeah. An investigation showed that the autopsy reports from 1948 and 1949 are now missing and the Bar Smith Library's collection of Coroner Cleland's notes don't contain anything pertaining to the case. Massage Henberg, who had examined the ID card and was a professor of anatomy at the University of Adelaide, had examined pictures of the Somerton man's ears and noted that his simba, which is the upper ear hollow, was larger than his cavum, which is your lower ear hollow. Mm-hmm. This is a feature seen in only 1-2% to of the Caucasian population. In May 2009, Abbott consulted with dental experts who noted that the Somerton man had hypodontia of both lateral incisors, which is a feature found in only 2% of the general population. Hypodontia is defined as the de- developmental absence of one or more teeth excluding the third molars, so excluding your wisdom teeth. Um, so basically he was missing his lateral incisors. Um, but it wasn't that they had been removed or fallen out. They, it never, was, came. they never came down. Now, it doesn't affect your baby teeth. It only affects your adult teeth. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> In June 2010, after Abbott obtained a photo of Robin Thompson, it was examined only to find that Robin, much like the Somerton man, had a larger Simba than Cavum, as well as hypod- Hypodontia. Now, the chances of this being a coincidence were estimated as between 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. Yeah, because it's a rare thing. This led to media speculation that Robin Thompson was the Somerton man's son and had been passed off as Prosper Thompson's. Um, So I suppose the theory was that the Somerton man was looking for his child. I was thinking that as Um, well. And that he had known that Jessica Jo lived in this area and that it was him that was looking for her. Um... Abbott found Robin's daughter, Rachel, who had been adopted. Robin is the son. Mm -hmm. Rachel's his daughter. Yeah. So Rachel had been adopted and raised in New Zealand and reached out to her. Fun fact, Derek Abbott and Rachel um, Egan ended up getting married. Oh. And they have three kids and a painting of the Somerton man hanging in their home as they believe him to be family. However, testing of Rachel's DNA showed that she is in fact related to Prosper Thompson. So it showed um, it showed relations to his grandparents. So she is a Thompson. Um, she's not related to the Somerton man, as far as I could tell from my research. Mm-hmm. In December 2017, Abbott announced that three hairs had been found in the plaster cast of the Somerton man's face and that they were in excellent condition for DNA testing. In 2018, test results came back of the high-definition analysis of the mitochondrial DNA with findings showing that the Somerton man belonged to haplogroup H4A1A1A, which is a group that only 1% of Europeans belong to. Now, as mitochondrial DNA is only inherited through the maternal line, it was impossible to test Rachel Egan's DNA against this sample. Okay. Um, now, this is where it gets a bit exciting. On July 26th, 2022, Derek Mm -hmm. Abbott announced that he had been working with genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick 
and that they had finally identified the Somerton Man. I knew I saw a man. headline about this before, mm-hmm. not long back. Now, this isn't fully verified by police, but let me tell you. Well, all the police were good for so far as losing evidence, so... Yeah. <laughs> um, so, they identified the Somerton Man as Carol or Charles Webb. Now, his name is Carol. I'm going to refer to him as Charles, just because that's what I've seen. Um, now, Charles Webb was an electrical engineer and instrument maker born on November 16th, 1905 in the Footscray suburb of Melbourne. According to Abbott, the identification was made through strands of hair found in the plaster face mask and through investigative genie... I can't talk. Allergy. Through investigative genetic genealogy, they were able to find matches for descendants of two distant cousins of Charles Webb both on the paternal and maternal side. None of Webb's living relatives in 2022 had known him in person, and at first there were no pre-death photos of him, but upon further investigation, it's believed he is present in a 1921 photograph of the Swinburne University football team, though he is not identified directly in this image. But in November 2022... Australian story revealed photos of Charles Webb from the 1920s that were found in a Webb photo album. I would also like to add in that apparently ABC, um, I think they released a picture of him, but it was actually his brother Roy. Okay. Um, Forensic Science South Australia have declined to comment on this, but South Australia police who are attempting to verify this information have said they are, quote, Cautiously optimistic that this may provide a breakthrough. End quote. But I mean, like, okay, so far, anyway, like, it's great to obviously break through, find out who he is, but what the fuck happened to him is what I want to know. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of what's known about Charles Webb, and there is a theory, um, and that's kind of the last bit that I have on this case. Okay. So Charles's father, Richard August Webb. Who I kind, I kind of like that. Richard August Webb. Yeah, no, no, Mike. Yeah. Um, who passed away in 19, 1939, had emigrated to Australia from Hamburg, Germany. He married Eliza Amelia Morris Grace. I like that name. It's such a well. pretty name, Eliza Amelia Morris Grace, who passed in 1946, and the two married in 1892. And they opened a bakery in Springvale, Victoria. Charles was born on November 16th, or November, as I have it written here, uh, in, <laughs> in 1905 in Footscray, as I mentioned earlier, and was the youngest of six children. All three of Richard and Eliza's sons would go on to work in their bakery, and when it closed down, Charles retrained as an electrical instrument maker. In 1941, he married Dorothy, known as Doff Robertson, which I've never heard that before. Like, I've heard of, like, Dot as a nickname for yeah. Dorothy, but not Doff. I think D-O-F-F. I've even heard of Dotty, but... Yeah, um, D-O-F-F, Doff. Um, Dorothy was a pharmacist and chiropodist and the couple moved into a flat in Bromby Street, South Yarra. The marriage was not great due to Charles' personality. <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can you, what can I'm you? not trying to be funny, but would you not have known that before you said yes? <laughs> yeah, what can you do? <laughs> um, so Dorothy described him as solitary and having few friends. He lived... <laughs> He lived a quiet life and liked to be in bed by 7pm each night. Relatable, except for 7pm. Yeah, but he was also moody, threatening and violent, especially when facing defeat over even the most trivial of things. BPD. Um, <laughs> no, that was a bad generalisation. We don't get violent, we just get upset. <laughs> um, he was fond of poetry and wrote several poems of his own with Dorothy, Dorothy stating most of them were on the subject of death, which he claimed as his greatest desire. Well, you got it, mate. Mm-hmm. Um, this would be consistent with him owning a copy of the Rubaiyat. Oh, his greatest desire. Maybe it was suicide then. Because mm-hmm. um, he loved poetry. He wrote poetry. The Rubaiyat is a poetry book. And as well, the Rubaiyat um, focuses on the subject of death. Now, Dorothy recalled one incident in March 1946 where, excuse me, Charles attempted to overdose with ether in a suicide attempt. What? Ether? Ether, um, ether, no, I don't want to lose that page. Hang on, that's, yes. Um, so ether, there's like the, the sense of, oh, you're in the ether. 
um, but in this case it's a chemical. Um, Any so type it of can organic be compound characterized by an oxygen atom bonded to two. Da, 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 da. Okay. So that's it's 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 a chemical in this case. A flammable chemical that contains an oxygen atom tied to two alkyl groups. Generally colourless, sweet smelling liquid at room temperature. Why are you holding your glasses like you're eighty years old? What love? <laughs> what? what did you say, pet? Ash, you're a great girl, you are. I can't hear the writing. And how was your mommy and daddy doing? Who? <laughs> <laughs> um. So after this suicide attempt, Dorothy nursed Charles back to health, only for him to scold her <laughs> and oh. become more violent. He said, "Why didn't you let me die? <laughs> yeah. You stupid bitch." <laughs> Um, in September 1946... I saved your life. Yeah, I didn't want to be saved. <laughs> we're going to stop laughing now, but... <laughs> Are in, we? Yes, in September 1946... <laughs> I'm going to laugh out of awkwardness now in a minute. I just, I can feel it. Just stop. No, it's when you're telling me that sensitive. it's not supposed to laugh. It's, okay, that's, get your it's, laughter out of It's your like when then. the teacher says, now, do you know, no talking. <laughs> yeah. And then you look at your friend across the room and you don't talk, but you burst out laughing instead. Yeah. Um. So in Nervous September... Laughter. Pending. Or when you get called to the office and you have that, like, I used to, I used to get such, like... They're like, it's not funny, Like, Miss Kirk would call me to the office and I'd be sitting there skitting at her or, like, smiling at her and she used to get so annoyed over it, but I just couldn't help it. Like, it wasn't that I actually found the situation funny. I just didn't know how to handle myself. Yeah. <laughs> I was out of pocket. So, in September 1946, after enduring many years of physical and verbal abuse, Dorothy left Charles. Charles moved out of their home in 1947 and seems to have disappeared. As of 2022, there is no record of his death. In 1951, Dorothy was apparently living in Butte, South Australia, which is 144 kilometres or 89 miles from Adelaide, and Abbott believes that Charles was trying to find her. Dorothy applied for divorce in 1951. Well, so maybe he was snooping around Joe's home thinking that she could be living there, not Joe. Yeah, thinking that he was thinking it was his wife's home. Um... Dorothy applied for divorce in 1951 on grounds of desertion and it was granted in April 1952. Charles's older sister, Frieda Grace, was married to one Thomas Gerald Keane. Have a think about it. Think about why that seems familiar. I can see you're dissociating. No, I'm thinking. Thomas Keane? Yeah. T. Keane? On the clothes in the suitcase. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's our new sound effect for um for things that blow our minds. What the fuck? Yeah, so Thomas and ASMR. Frida Thomas and Frida had a son named John who died in World War Two in nineteen forty two, as did Charles and Frida's brother Roy. John's possessions had included items that implied he had lived in the U.S. at some point, such as U.S. coins and a map of Chicago. Frieda Grace and Charles had lived a 20-minute drive apart, which could explain why the Somerton man had clothes with U.S. origins and bearing the name Keane, as they could have been second-hand from his brother-in-law and or his nephew. Abbott's research also showed that Charles liked to bet on horses, meaning the coded messages could have been horses' names or something to do with betting, gambling or horse races. Um, Derek Abbott and Colleen Fitzgerald believe that Charles had serious mental health issues right, and had, bro. and had, you know, honestly, <laughs> mood, mood, and had, quote, spiralled down after losing four close relatives in seven years because he oh, lost wow. his mother, his father, his brother and his nephew. Yeah. And of course his wife left him yeah. in that length of time. His history, coupled with the autopsy findings, suggests that he committed suicide by poisoning himself. Yeah. And that is what I have on this case. I would be inclined to go with that as well. That mm -hmm. sounds like it adds up. I, I think and for there to have been no death certificate, like as in, you know, no body or no yeah. record of him dying, it would make sense for that to have been him because it That's, was a mystery like, for so I, long. I do think that. And then I know I was originally... I do thinking. still think it's weird, though, that that Joe on had a reaction yeah like oh, right so what I th I don't know why she reacted to that but the, I think that the reason she said to police that she was that she had married after the war was I think she was having an affair with Prosper while Maybe. he was married to his first wife and I think she got pregnant with Robin during this affair yeah 
and then they married. And also a time of a, you had a bastard child. Yeah, and then they married after. <laughs> it's not after a very nice divorced. word, yeah. but like, yeah. it's what they called it then, and I'm a bastard, and I've no shame in it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that's what I was thinking, is maybe she was trying to not be shamed by the police for having a child out of wedlock and as the product of an affair, and that's why she lied about being married right after the war had ended. Yeah, I like you being cute with your little wedlock out of wedlock and me being like, BASTARDS! <laughs> yeah, out of wedlock. Um, I don't know why she reacted the way she did to the man's bust. Um, Maybe she was a spy and she was just reacting. It very well But then be. again, you should know how to react in a situation yeah, like that when I you're know, a spy. Maybe, maybe because it was like, I've often seen it called the death mask because he was dead when they did it and maybe that's what kind of shocked her. Um, Excuse me. But yeah, that's the case of the Somerton man. Um, I think it's very interesting to finally have potentially some answers because I know I've listened to many YouTubers and podcasts cover this case. Yeah. And I've always wondered, like, who is he? What happened? How that sounds like there? a this solid answer to mm-hmm. me. Case I closed. think so. The fact he had a brother-in-law <laughs> called Thomas Keane um, and the fact that his nephew had been in the US at some point suggests to me that his nephew bought that jacket there and maybe his sister... Or the, his nephew's mother, his sister, had given it to him um, because wartime rations, clothes were hard to come by. There's a lot of logic to it. Mm-hmm. I would be inclined to. And go then with the that. clothes wouldn't have had tags because he would have taken the tags off once he got his hands on the clothes, and they were his clothes. And maybe he just never got around to sewing his own name onto them. Exactly. And then in terms of Keen being on the laundry bag, the undershirt, and what was the other thing? Laundry bag, undershirt, and on a tie, I think. Yes, I think it was, yeah. Um, like, I think a laundry bag, it's not important enough for you to want to take someone else's name off it. A tie, why would you bother? A tie, why would you bother? And an undershirt, why would you bother? No one's going to see it. Yeah. And if they're going to see it, they're going to know your name's not yeah. keen. Um, so I personally do believe Charles Webb could very well be the Somerton man. Yeah, I am very I'm intrigued. fairly sold on that. I'm very intrigued to hear if it gets verified anytime soon. Um... And let me just do a cursory search there to see if it... Like, to me, I mean, yeah, fair enough, police might not have officially backed it up, but, like, if gen- if genetics has already backed it up, what more is there to confirm? Yeah, exactly. Um, I got no. I'm trying to... Think my internet here is always shit, but I... Oh, yeah, the data here is not good. Um. Yeah. Please hold. Mm, also, a representative will be with you in a moment. Um, at some point, We're Derek... expecting a high volume of calls at the moment. <laughs> Triggered. Um, at some Any point... Any of you from around here know exactly what Let I'm referencing. Let me speak. No, shut up. You've already done an hour and 20 minutes of it. Um, Derek Abbott um, at one point released an artistic impression of what the Somerton Man would have looked like because he felt that a lot of people wouldn't have recognised him from the photo of him dead. Yeah. Um, so... I think that's his nephew. That's I've seen the one on the left. That's yeah. him. That's the picture of him um, when he was dead. That's his brother. Similar, very, very similar. Very similar. It's the ears. It, Even it, the whole face to me, yeah, though. Yeah, he does have, like, the Somerton man had very distinctive ears. Um, and as per, there will be um, pics. photos on the Instagram, Facebook posts. Um, I'm trying to show you. This is the artistic um, impression. If it will load. It looks much the same, really. It's just his eyes are open and he's smiling. Oh yeah, look, there we go. Like, see how the ear curves off at the top? Very distinctive, yeah. in my opinion. And then this is what's meant by he's he's not got any incisors. But his, um, these teeth are quite sharp. Point, pointy. Pointy, pointy. Um, and then these are family photos, so they believe that that's him. And I have to say, it does bear a striking resemblance and the ears it's i don't know why i'm focusing on the ears guys but if you wait till you see the pictures the ears are distinctive she likes ears <laughs> i've got i haven't got a foot fetish i've got an ear fetish i don't actually have an ear fetish that's that i wonder is that actually a thing it is i heard josh i'd fucking i'd go white and pale if i saw that okay too. yeah 
Yeah. That is terrifying. No, that's like a weeping angel from Doctor Who gone very, very, very yeah, wrong. We'll, and that's saying something. I, I, Joe's reaction was justified. That's justified. No, maybe she's not a Russian spy. Maybe she's just a woman that got freaked out. Yeah, like that is that was creepy. I wouldn't really be inclined to like to see that either. Very strange. In person especially. Anywho. So yeah, that is the case of the Somerton Man slash to man should case. Slash, what's the Sorry, name? Sorry, Tamam. I, I, every time my brain goes to say Taman, but it's Tamam and slash Carol Charles Webb. So there. Once again, thank you for listening. Five stars on. And even like that's someone who's supposed to be related Apple to him, and Podcasts, he really Stephen. looks like him. Yeah, you can see the resemblance. Strong um, genes in the family. Strong genes. But yeah, okay. Give us five stars on any platforms that let you give reviews. Um. Let me give you some iced coffee ASMR. Get jiggy with it. Um, and yeah, message us with any recommendations, cases you want us to cover. Thanks to those of you who've already given us recommendations. Thank you to all of you who listen in the first place. We enjoy you and very much. And we recently, well, by the time this, will, it'll probably have changed a bit by the time this goes up, because obviously this is where recording head. Mm-hmm. But we, I meant to, I screenshot it, but I don't want to actually sent it to you. We have officially hit over a thousand streams. Have we? We have. Oh, that's so cool. Our episodes. Go um, on. So, loving that. Um, and yes, once again, like I said, thanks for listening. Uh, love and gratitude to all of you from us both. Thank you for a thousand streams. Yes, and share us with your friends. Mm-hmm. Well, share the podcast, not us. We're not for sale. If um, we get if we get to five thousand streams, we're going to start a Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> we should we that is in the books at some stage though we do want to do mm. that um we have been um brainstorming names we will i suppose if and when the time comes we can just put the names up on the instagram and do a poll and oh, that's you guys can well. choose it yeah we can have a general consensus out of, we can pick like our top three or something and then mm-hmm. put them up and get votes yeah mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. we have to scroll back in the chat to find the suggestions because we text way too much honestly we're kind of obsessed with each other BPD in it. Uh, you're my favourite person. I'm my favourite person too. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't half love himself. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm anyway, th- ending on that facade. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking we need to start just doing like 20 minutes of us just chatting shit at the start to get it all out of our systems. You know probably, what though? I think it's cancelled. better off at the end. <laughs> Yeah. Because then at least people Yeah, exactly. Then it's like optional. You can keep listening to us babble. No, if you're not listening and it gets you minus one point as a fan. Just so you know. Peekaboo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, okay, so once again with that, thanks for listening. Um I have an appointment to get to. Um I also have an appointment to get to. So Thanks again. It's and been real, guys. What language will I say goodbye in today? Uh, French. Au revoir. Ah, si. Okay. Tschüss. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>